Now let's pray and we will dig into the Word of God. Father, thank you for this church house you provided for the saints to gather so that we can petition heaven in our prayer meeting, that we can study the Word of God together, we can exalt you in, on song, in song on Sunday, we can gather for gospel-centered fellowship. God, you've been so lavish in your kindness towards us who deserved wrath and that wrath was meted out on your son that he might give us eternal life. Thank you for Jesus. Uh, inflame our passionate pursuit of Christ in 2022. Use us in the Rogue Valley to advance your fame, uh, calling others into saving fellowship with our Redeemer. We praise you for Christ. We pray in his name as well. Amen. Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. My clicker is not connecting yet. Hey, there we go. All right, let me get back to where I... Ah, there we go. All right, we, we want to... I put together this lesson on witnessing to Jehovah's Witnesses, a fast-growing Christian cult. First Peter chapter 3, verse number... 15 may be a scripture memory verse that some of you have committed to memory in years gone by. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready in your hearts to make a defense for everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. At any given moment, we ought to be ready to give the gospel. We ought to be ready to segue in our conversation to eternal matters and what people are going to do with Christ. When Jehovah's Witnesses come to the door, pre-COVID crackdown, I don't know what they're doing these days because they're not uh, darkening my, my door, but... Oftentimes, they'd come to the door at the least opportune times. I would ne never be curt with those, but I'd usually be right involved in something where I was not engaging the opportunity for the gospel. In contrast to a series we did a, a year or so ago on gospel readiness. So that's all to my, my shame. When somebody comes knocking to your door, you find somebody that is lost in the Jehovah Witness cult. They are not the enemy. They are not the inconvenience. They're the divine gospel opportunity that we need to engage for the glory of God and the good of their soul. The reason I've subtitled it, this uh, lesson, A Fast-Growing Christian Cult, is that it's a perversion of biblical Christianity, unlike the non-Christian religions of the world that don't even claim to be within the ranks, like Hinduism or Buddhism or Islam. Jehovah Witnesses would be in the same cultic camp of Mormonism, Christian science, Seventh-day Adventism, theosophy, best known for its door-to-door -door approach to evangelism, like I said, at least pre-COVID, members instilled with urgency and missionary zeal. The founder, Charles Taze Russell, lived from 1852 to 1916, raised in Allegheny, Pennsylvania. He was indoctrinated in the teachings of the Congregational Church. He managed several clothing stores. Early on, he had a strong fear of hell, but later abandoned the idea uh, of eternal punishment when he got involved with the teaching of Seventh-day Adventism, and he could get that ugly uh, monster off his shoulders and pangs of his conscience. He began teaching Bible classes, thus mistakenly got the title pastor, though he was never ordained to the gospel ministry. 
He was heavily influenced by Adventism and promoted his version of it extensively. He was extremely egotistical, making absurd claims about himself, even encouraging the reading of his books to the neglect of Scripture. He allowed his followers to associate him with such men as the Apostle Paul, Wycliffe, and Luther, great reformer. Uh, his wife divorced him in 1913 on grounds of adultery. He was conceited, egotistical, and dominate, domineering the relationship. He was charged with fraudulent activities, even perjuring himself in court. Under oath, he claimed to know the Greek alphabet, but couldn't even identify any of the letters upon request to do so. No wonder why Jehovah Witnesses seek to disassociate themselves from their founder and dislike even being branded Russellites. Well, after he was done, you've got Joseph Franklin Rutherford that succeeded him as president of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, 1917. As in society, he moved from lawyer to assistant judge. So in this movement, he moved up in leadership until he reached a point in the society of unquestioned authority. And so you've got a founder who was egotistical, and now you've got a guy who is unquestioned in authority. Any question would be an assault on his authority. In 1931, taking his cue from Isaiah 43.10, do you know what Isaiah 43.10 says right off the bat, you Old Testament scholars? Um, uh, Isaiah records the, the words of God, you are my witnesses. And so him taking that section of Scripture to be their, their new brand as an organization, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, then known uh, as the Jehovah Witnesses, in an attempt to disconnect totally from Russell. Rutherford's constant denunciation towards organized religion developed a tone among his followers of hostility toward Christian churches. And virtually, uh, he had virtually no public ministry like Russell, his predecessor, had, but he was a prolific writer of books and booklets. Um, to be part of the Jehovah Witness movement is to be a, be a voracious reader because training is crucial to the movement. Would to God we would have half as many Christians as zealous about training as Jehovah Witnesses. Well, their third president was Nathan Homer Knorr, proved to be a strong administrator, and under his leadership, was the emphasis and stress of training their people. And so the kingdom halls, people gather there for training, intense training. And again, before we get to some scripture, because this is Bible study, this is what we do at Grace Bible Church, we, we emphasize the Bible, uh, not heresy. So some, some troubling points. In the movement, they place reason above the teachings of Scripture and reject anything in the Bible that's beyond man's understanding. That's led to a systematic denial of most of the doctrines of historic Christianity, especially the doctrine of the Trinity and Christ being the God-man, being truly God and truly man at the same time. You know, When it comes to the Trinity, three in oneness, It reminds me of an old statement I heard years ago. Try to understand the Trinity and you might lose your mind. You're kind of trying to unscrew the inscrutable aspect of the nature of God. Yet, if you explain it away, you'll lose your soul. So they place reason above the teaching of scriptures. Second of all, the denial of the deity of Jesus Christ as well as the Holy Spirit. So the second and third members of the Trinity are not God. Denial of Christ's bodily resurrection as well as his second coming. And while claiming the Bible's authority, their literature and doctrine are the infallible interpreters of scripture, tolerating no deviation. 
No Jehovah Witness has a right to his own inductive judgment. If you, after all, if you unleash him on the word of God, he might understand uh, that uh, uh, it doesn't jive with scripture. Whereas you take a, a Bible church that understands the church as the pillar and ground of truth, we relish the thought of hermeneutics classes and training God's people how to handle the word of God so that they can be Bereans. I'm, you know, I got a very public ministry. Our, all of our preaching and teaching goes on two YouTube channels and two websites, and people live stream us. And when you come up to the sacred desk, you cannot be one who is above questions like their second founder was. We want people to see if what they are hearing from the sacred desk, this pulpit, jives with the word of God. Well, oh, yeah, I guess we're going back to their troublesome points, not what uh, our convictions are here. But uh, furthermore, their incompetent translation, the New World Translation, has anonymous producers with no way of knowing their credentials. So when you have the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures, I've got a copy. So we know that in Pastor Parker's study, all heresy is spying in, so you can't be sitting there for counseling and seeing, oh, Pastor Parker thinks the New World Translations, I ought to be having my devotions out of. We don't. You can't even find out the credentials of those who are the supposed translators because, um, well, it's probably not from the original languages, probably more like interlinear editions where they can distort passages to make them conform to the erroneous doctrines of Jehovah Witness dogma. Let me give you an example. So you, you might have seen my bookmark hanging out of here to... John 1.1, 1, 1. John 1.1, 1, 1. matter of fact, take your, Bible, your copy of God's Word and go to John 1.1 1, 1 and see if this translation jives with what you see on the page before your eyes. In John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, and the is in brackets here, in the beginning... The Word was, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. Now, pop quiz. Time for a little uh, Greek lesson here. Um, there is no definite article in the Greek that underscores John 1 corresponding to our English word a or an. When John writes that the Word was, what did your Bible say? Was God, not a God, little g. The Word was God. There is no call for the indefinite article for neither the Old Testament nor the New Testament reveal more than one true God. And we're not concerned over the doctrine of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three persons in oneness, one God. Let me move along. Now, for years I've been shepherding people that I, I think that the, the best apologetic is not keeping up with all the new names and the nuances of new heresies. There is no, it's pretty hard to invent a, a new doctrine. They always have just a new name, a new face, a slight nuance, a difference. And so the best thing is not trying to keep up with all of those things. Just study systematically the ten doctrines of Scripture so that anything you hear and see, if it doesn't smell right, you go back to the Scriptures. If you learn the ten major doctrines of Scripture, most of which are on Biblical Expositor, if you're interested. I'm still doing a little organizing there, so it's easy to find the stuff. We're just going to point out three here tonight for the significance of our study on reach, witnessing to Jehovah's Witnesses. The first would be the doctrine of God. The doctrine of God. 
What does the Bible teach us on the Trinity? It teaches that there is only one God. Deuteronomy 6.4 is when he references there. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Or, as my kids had to memorize in their catechism, that there is one God. Jeremiah 10.10. I didn't give you that reference. Maybe you want to jot it down. This is what they had to memorize, the verse, uh, their scripture memory. The Lord is the true God. He is the living God. Now, this is another benefit of scripture memory, not just for the edification of your own soul sanctification, but that readiness with a biblical answer on the tip of your tongue. So they come knocking or they engage with you in conversation at the grocery store, you can automatically spit out a verse. You unsheath the sword of the Spirit. The Bible needs no defending. It comes with its own authority. Just like a, Spurgeon said, uh, the, the Word of God is just like a lion. You have to defend a lion, just let it out of its cage. And if you've memorized some key verses in regards to how you answer a Jehovah Witnesses, Spirit just has to Blow the cobwebs off your memory banks and you spit it out. So the Bible and the Trinity, there is only one God, but three distinct persons in the Godhead. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Another reference I didn't give you there on the three distinct persons, you might want to jot down Ephesians 1 because in Ephesians 1, you can see Trinitarian redemption the different roles, the Father orchestrated redemption's plan, sends the Son to accomplish redemption, and then the Spirit applies that redemption when people hear the faithful proclamation of the gospel and breathes new life into people's dead souls. So in contrast to the Bible on the Trinity, Jehovah's Witness says the doctrine of Trinity is a false, quote, a false unbiblical doctrine originated by Satan. Now, I've got all the references. I've out, I'm giving you what Scripture says on these next three slides because we want to major on the Word of God, not the dogma of Jehovah's Witnesses. And so I've got the references as to what, what resources I pulled these out of, whether it be make sure of all these things, let God be true, make sure of that, the watchtower, and many other resources. So they would just say that it's a false, unbiblical doctrine. How about Christ the Son? The Bible says that he is eternal, uncreated God. Jehovah's Witness says that he is, was originally the first created being of Jehovah. We've got problems with that. Bible teaches Jesus ro arose in the same body that was laid in the tomb, which explains the marks of crucifixion, the empty tomb, and the empty burial wrappings. When, when Thomas is doubting, and what does Jesus say? You know, stick your finger in. You know, the, he, he bore the marks of crucifixion, a physical body. Jehovah's Witness theology says he arose from the grave as a spirit person, Jehovah allowing him to materialize a different body in which to appear to his disciples. You see why Jehovah's Witness is considered a cult? They do not affirm the Jesus of the gospel record, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We must affirm the resurrection account. It's part of the gospel message. In the gospel, in a nutshell, when Paul writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15, he includes it there. Last bullet point on the doctrine of God. The Holy Spirit, Scripture teaches, is an eternal person possessing all the essence of God. Jehovah's Witness says he is not a person, but rather the impersonal active force of God. Okay, how about the doctrine of man? Jesus taught life after death. You notice your Luke 16 reference? You remember what's in Luke 16? Luke 16 is the rich man and Lazarus. And that there is a gulf fixed between the two after death. 
and he's pleading. If I could just go back and tell my brethren about this horrible place, he said, they have Moses and the prophets. They got the scriptures. Jesus taught life after death and continuing life after death the same day. In Luke 23, we've got the crucifixion account. There are, in the crucifixion account, we've got three crosses. Jesus in the middle and a criminal on both sides of him. And the, the thief that places his faith in Christ, Jesus says, truly I say to you, what's the next word? Today you'll be with me in paradise. Jesus taught life after death, continuing life after death the same day. And Paul added an independent existence apart from the body. For instance, in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, I gave you verses 5 to 8, but in verse 8, Paul says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Is that not a glorious hope for the believer to live in every moment of our sojourn that we're not done on planet earth until the very second God's calling us home. And in that very second we're called home, we're in the very presence of God. No intermediary state, not limbo, but once we're mowing the lawn by the sweat of our brow, Genesis 3, and the next moment we're in God's very presence where there's fullness of joy. Let me go back from preaching to uh, teaching here. Uh, in regards to the doctrine of man, the Bible teaches the immortality of the soul is a God-inspired truth. And the resurrection is a returning of the soul. Actually, before I do that third bullet point, I guess I didn't give you the... Uh, the uh, Jehovah Witness rebuff on life after death. Jehovah Witness teaches a person's soul is an inseparable part of the body so that when a person dies, there's no continued existence of the soul. Now on to that last bullet point. The resurrection is a returning of the soul back to its body and will happen when Christ returns. Jehovah Witness teaches there is no continual existence of the soul after death. So... Jehovah Witnesses after death will eventually be recreated from Jehovah's memory to inhabit the kingdom, unquote. Third doctrine. In Ephesians 1, verses 3 to 14, we learn that Jesus' death Purchase present forgiveness of sins and blessings beyond this earthly existence. Paul talks to the saints at Ephesus that we have through Christ we have all the spiritual blessings in the heavens. To be in Christ is to have everything. That little word preposition in, in Christ, is life altering and eternal changing. Because if you're clothed in the righteousness of Christ, you've got all the blessings of heaven. That means to be outside of him is to have none of them blessed. Christ's death only provides... Oh, I guess I didn't give you the Jehovah Witness response. Um, Jehovah Witness teaches his death only purchased for mankind the earthly life and earthly blessings lost when Adam sinned. Second bullet point on the doctrine of salvation. Christ's death only provides salvation from sin for those who repent and receive this sacrifice as a gift by faith. The eternal life given by grace to believers is also preserved by God. Job Witness teaches that his death only provides an opportunity for a person to attain salvation through obeying God's law and there's no assurance of eternal life. Does John not record for us that he that has the Son has the life? He that has not the Son does not have the life, but the wrath of God abides on him. That as many as believed him, to them he gave the right to be called the children of God. So we take God's word for it as believers. There is absolute assurance 
that when you trust Christ as your Savior, you are guaranteed forgiveness of sin and eternity in His presence. Thirdly, salvation is offered only through trusting Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Jehovah Witness dogma says one can live in God's paradise only through, number one, studying the Bible. So that's the first aspect of our works. Second, associated, associating with the Jehovah Witnesses, guaranteeing the growth of the movement, right? Thirdly, changing living habits from the former way to God's way, which also requires Jehovah Witness baptism. So baptism is uh, a work. Of our salvation. And fourth, being a preacher and a witness of God's kingdom. Finally, as real as heaven is in scriptural writ, there is also not just a heaven to be gained, but a hell to be lost. And hell is a place of everlasting torment for the unrepentant wicked. They would say that the doctrine of a burning hell where the wicked are tortured eternally after death is false. Several months ago, we were in our study of Mark's gospel and Mark 9, that reference there, verses 47 and 48, and there'll be some more teaching on that in the future when I get a rough draft of the chapter ready for, you, you can pray for your pastor, I can uh, try to get some of that work done uh, over these next few weeks. So in summary, you know, on, on top of their teachings that, that Christ only paid partial atonement, the distortion of the bodily resurrection, the return of the Lord Jesus, and the emphatic denial of hell, number one, the theology of Jehovah Witnesses denies or distorts almost every significant biblical truth. You know, I'd mentioned the Trinity, the deity of Christ, virgin birth, Resurrection, second coming, work of Christ, etc., etc. Number two, they arrive at their position by imposing a false system of doctrine on the scriptures, directly traceable to the writings of Charles Taze Russell. So, no matter if you change the name of your organization and try to distance yourself from your founder, this is what it's teaching. Thirdly, this cult violates every sound principle of hermeneutics, which is Bible interpretation, including but not limited to taking strings of verses out of context, making Hebrew and Greek terms mean only what they want them to, using their subpar translation given by anonymous translators. Let me uh, hasten to say, you know, in my study, not only is the New World Translation of the Scriptures spine in among several translations of Scripture. I've got my Greek language resources. I've got my Hebrew language resources, whether it be the Hebrew that the Old Testament is written in or the Greek that the New Testament was originally written in. You've got lexicons that tell you this is what the word means no matter how you try to reinvent the definition. You've got grammars, many grammars, teaching that when you've got this, uh, this way of putting words and sentences and phrases together, which is grammar, here's what it's intending to accomplish. Number four. This is just another in a long line of works-oriented salvation as it minimizes the efficacy of Christ's redemptive work. Even though it is a quote-unquote Christian cult, it is a cult nonetheless. It is a non-saving system. It's something among many teachings of our day that calls us into more intentional systematic Bible study so we can unsheath the sword of the Spirit in our conversations given the context of the passages for those willing to listen. We understand that Jesus teaches there is a 
broad way and a narrow way. There's few that are going to come to saving faith in comparison to the many people who will ever live. We understand that. But there are going to be those that come. May not be many willing, but you know, just this morning in my devotional time, I was praying for Orlando. Orlando is the acquaintance of a missionary friend. And this missionary friend, when he arrived just this past summer, came to find out that this, this guy, this Jehovah Witness, understands that the Jehovah Witness system that he had grown up ever since he was a child, this guy knows is wrong. Orlando knows it's a wrong system. And so he's, he's given an open ear to my missionary friend. He's willing to discuss the Bible versus this system that he's learned ever since childhood. So pray for Orlando in Colombia. And beloved, pray for divine appointments like that. We want to be ready to be faithful tools in the Spirit's hands to rescue the perishing. Don't allow your conscience to become guilty through things that I have been convicted of in the past when I haven't taken enough time with those that came knocking to the door. The deity of Christ should be central in any conversation, constantly taking them back to his goodness. So one more passage, and we'll be in the with our study for tonight. Run with me over to 1 John 2, if you would. Now I'd remind you that in 1 John, actually, let me back up. The Gospel of John is an extended Gospel track teaching us how to believe in Christ. 1 John is a letter written on assurance of that salvation, knowing that you believe. What good is a salvation if you don't know if you have it? So John gives all these tests of salvation. He gives tests for the, of love for the brethren, or do you love the world? One of the tests he gives to examine our faith to see if we're in Christ is what we do with Christ. So 1 John chapter 2, set your eyes on verse 18, if you would. 1 John 2, 18. Children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out so that it would be shown that they are not of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Notice verse 22. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? If somebody says Jesus is not Messiah, they've got the wrong answer. He's a liar, John says. This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. As for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. This is the promise which he himself made to us, eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. As for you, the anointing which you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all, the, all things, and is true and is not a lie, just as it has taught you, you abide in him. So don't be deceived by the plethora of lies all around us. You want to know if somebody's right about the Father, right about heaven, right about eternity? What's their view of the Son? Now, right before I pray, I don't remember, I forgot to look in the book nook. We might have a book on the cults back there, but since I was addressing this tonight, Walter Martin is probably uh, one of the best tomes. Uh, he, it's titled The Kingdom of the Cults. There's a lot of false teachings around, a lot of world religions and um, quote-unquote Christian cults like uh, Jehovah's Witnesses would fall into. Kenneth Boa 
cults, world religions, and the occult. And so make sure you've got at least one book in your library on um, answering the matters. And let me tell you about one resource that's going to be in the book nook soon because Amazon won't have it to me until another week or so. Years ago, Roy, Roy Zuck, a professor down at Dallas Theological Seminary, had published an article in uh, Moody Monthly entitled, Letter to a Jehovah's Witness. And so, again, as you're boning up on the scriptures and true biblical doctrine, you might want to get yourself, I, I think I got half a dozen, maybe a dozen copies going into the book nook, and I don't know if it's two or three bucks or something, and you can kind of put it by the keys at the front door if they should start banging doors again, uh, even if they've got masks on and whatnot, so that you can hand them a letter uh, that's all prepared. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for the good news of the gospel. We do not have to hang our heads uh, wondering if we've been deluded, if we can hold up a biblical argument. Help us to share Paul's conviction. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the very power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Help us know the good news backwards and forwards. Help us know the scriptures backwards and forwards. Digging into the text of Scripture so that when we hear things that aren't quite right, we could take people to the Scriptures and unleash the authority of Scripture in their life. Trust in the Spirit to do that which we're incapable of. Thank you for the good news. We pray in Christ's name and for His sake. Amen. Questions?